to do these sort of things. So we, uh, we won our first client around about 2000 and end of 2009, uh, went live with them in 2010, which was NASDAQ. And we, we, to this day, we deliver in excess of 35,000 ad hoc live channels. So I took it, whoever it was was talking about standing up a channel in two months. Yes, you can do it quickly. We do maybe a few hundred a day. Peak, we might do a few thousand a day. Uh, and that's pretty much an end-to-end -end channel creation in a fully virtualized <coughs> Onto Amazon, we also gave them about 15% uh, 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 capex uh, reduction, sorry, annual opex reduction, uh, because obviously they, by virtualizing them with this incredibly fluctuating workflow where it ramps up to the end of quarters, thousands of news broadcasts going on. So yes, to answer your question, news is online. It's been online for quite a while. Um, we ramped them up, and then obviously there in the middle of uh, you know, middle of June, when there's no financial broadcast going on, we turn all the infrastructure off, and there's literally maybe one computer running, um, which is just managing some scheduling and, and oversight. So yeah, I'm a complete believer in cloud. Um, for those of you that are very techy and have understood things like network function virtualization and so on, the language we use is a language that's now 30 years old called Erlang. Uh, and it's extremely good for high availability. So uh, we tend to, where we have like Amazon East may, may pop one day, we'll fail the entire infrastructure over to Amazon West in maybe a GOP, maybe two GOPs of video, so maybe four or eight seconds. So that's how quickly we can do an entire infrastructure rebuild. Those are the sort of things that I believe in, and that's the sort of background that I come from. So Excellent. Same thing for you, Ed? Yep. Um, uh, so, um, <laughs> it's I, a confessional, I, I, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, true. I think it's quite <laughs> so, um, I, uh, I have been TV. attached to the call. I'll, I'll come out and say I have been, a, uh, I have been on cord, is that, is that phrase? Uh, I remember John Noakes, obviously, um, bless him. Um, but I was very quick to drop it. Uh, I've been working uh, in television pretty much since I left school. First job was with TVAM. Me. Um, yeah. So, pretty early days uh, in some animation, and it was through that that I got into computers, and computers got into, str I did my first streaming job was Wimbledon a long, long time ago, and we did some music stuff back in the day as well, little postage stamp sizing codes, and that's been going on and on, and now I work for a uh, big chunk of history, now I work for Perform, and uh, Perform Group is probably not that well known to people, but um, it, if you're into sport, and into, if you ever watch live sport on the internet, you've probably seen Perform products, because they normally deal B to B rather than B to C. Uh, if you are a broadcaster who um, uh, takes our content from our network, then you'll be taking our contribution streams. We're also a, a quite a large rights holder of, of uh, sport, such as the WTA and FIBA. Um, and we've recently done a new project. Uh, so far, it's in Japan, and it is in uh, the DAC region, Germany and Austria, um, and about to launch in Canada. I'm pretty sure I can say that now. I just did. <laughs> yeah. so when I'm no going back now, eh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a platform purely for sport. So quite interested in the previous session, uh, people were talking about platforms for sport, and that's exactly what we do. Um, I think the thing, I mean, I really enjoyed the previous session, and um, I'd like to address some of the questions about latency as well. Hopefully yeah. we can sort of cross over a little bit from the last session. Sure. And pick up some of the, the, the low latency things, and obviously in the... In the uh, sports industry, uh, latency is a very, very big deal. Um, and there's this, always this kind of slider in my head, which is slides from quality to latency. And it's something we have to try and find a, a happy medium there for some products. And we have to have uh, pure quality for some products. And we have to have very, very low latency for some products. And I can probably talk about how I address those different requirements. And last but not least, Jeff. This is Sky. I'm responsible for strategy and architecture of live streaming. So low latency is obviously something that's very relevant for sports. Um, hopefully we'll have an interesting sort of conversation about sort of the, the, some of the challenges of it and obviously some of the customer benefits of it. Um, I've been at Sky for actually 12 years. Uh, I came through networking and things like that. And I, was, I moved into being an architect in 2009 when we launched off uh, the first iOS application, which is called Sky Sports Mobile predecessor before Sky Go and Now TV came along. Uh, obviously I've worked in those propositions and more recently Sky Q. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great, it's fun and uh, it's challenging because every day is the, the marketplace is changing, there's new things coming along, there's, there's vendors coming up with new solutions to interesting problems or problems that you didn't think existed. And uh, obviously 
you know, um, I'd ask I'd ask Gail actually the the kind of virtualization is is something that's actually quite fundamental. You you have to do it, but you have to do it in the right way. So hopefully we'll talk about that. Okay, we're interested to know what the makeup of the audience is. So how many of you are publishers? Put your hands up. Technologists. Blimey. You're in the wrong room. <laughs> 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 All right. I'm just interested to know um, uh, who's out there. Um, let's start with you, Jeff. I mean, how viable is just in, cl in time um, cloud provisioning from a technical perspective? Okay, uh, so assuming that you've obviously got your content um, in the cloud, and so, so for on demand, um, it's, it's, it's quite easy because obviously everything's already in the past, you already have it. More challenging, so if you're trying to it's got to happen consistently. It's got to be reliable. You've got to do two of everything and all, all the kind of standard stuff. But in terms of the cloud, actually um, doing it in real time, I mean, if you compare it to, say, for example, doing on-premise, on-premise gives you total. You can have, you know, just the right side of storage and memory and network and everything. And you can make sure that you can literally over-engineer it. When you take that workload and you put it into a public cloud, your, you know, your uh, first thing that happens is you're in shared shared infrastructure, so you don't have control over it. So a good example would be if you're trying to get uh, a mezzanine feed in, um, you can run multicast in your own network because you have you can configure it on switches and, and routers and things. Um, when you go into the cloud, though, typically you don't have a multicast as an option. So immediately you already have to change your workflow on day one. Okay, very good. Uh, changing things about a bit. Um, Fusions abound, you know, whenever people are considering the cloud, they're looking at public-private. Um, Ed, when we were talking uh, about this panel, you were talking about scaling for success. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you give to uh, the audience? Um, yeah, so scaling for success is seems like a, a very, very basic, almost glib statement. Um, but it's traditionally, before virtual environments came along, it was quite terrifying. Uh, Performer fall into this trap many times, and I think virtualization is kind of relieving that, that, that pressure point. So what I mean by that is, um, in our own infrastructure, uh, when Perform launched a new product, virtually every single product Perform has ever done. When you come to the financial side of that and saying to the cap, this much data center to do this much work, um, they will say, well, let's launch it small first. But we're not gonna risk it. Let's just put a little bit of risk into that. And in that model, the worst thing that can happen to a business is it be successful. Because at some point, it's going to break. At some point, you're in, you're in trouble. So it's often the question of trying to forecast when that break point is and, and what extra reinforcements you need to do or what um, uh, change processes go in place or what new data centers has got to be equipped. And that constantly playing catch up with your almost inevitable growth is, is, is horrendous and very difficult to manage. And um, it's, been, it's been difficult in the past for Perform to... Uh, deal with its own its own success. Um, where virtualization, I think, is particularly exciting is that we can do uh, something quite differently uh, from the previous panel. Someone used the word experimentation. I'm looking for the person who said it, who sat here. Um, but experimentation is is um, uh, very key. So we can try out an idea. We can just have a go. We can spin it up and have a go. And if we design it correctly, if we scale that idea from the absolute ground upwards for success, then it should grow automatically. If it doesn't work, if there's a problem, either commercially, technically, or viability, the whole thing is wrong, it can fail, and it can fail fast, and it can fail painlessly. So it's being able to experiment, uh, change, and grow are the, are the absolute key things to, for us. Um, to do something that does not factor in success makes you wonder why you're bothering in the first place. You have to go in for success, and the only thing that can stop you is really just, just CapEx. And virtualization moves into OpEx, and we just throw more at it as, as we need as a business succeeds. Okay, good answer. Um, Dom, orchestration key for cloud deployments? I mean, we keep hearing it all the time, but I think those yeah, sort of like me who can remember <laughs> IBC down in Brighton, um, it's a new term. Why is it key? So I think it's also probably, there's a, f a few terms. If I just slightly sidetrack just a second. Oh, we'll oh I haven't got a handle here. So for there's three, three terms which are being widely bandied about yeah. at the moment which need to be tamed a little bit. There's OTT, yep. there's cloud, and then there's orchestration. Okay, so just to be p a pedant, because I write a lot for the press and the, the trade press and so on, and I'm fussy about the, the way we use words. 
Um, OTT is becoming a sort of replacement for stuff that's delivered online for video. And actually, OTT in its pure form means the paywall is outside the subscriber network. So have a think about that, ruminate on that. That's what OTT actually means. So when we talk about de you know, delivering OTT, yeah. Skype's an OTT service, for example. And in fact, pretty much anything you, where you use e-commerce and service. So let's be a bit pedantic. When you, when you look at specifically, sorry, particularly CDN architectures. The other one is cloud, and I, I, I always kick off any cloud-based event that I'm talking about by highlighting that I think cloud is an economic forum, certainly yeah. public cloud. Uh, and I like the fact that both uh, Jeff and Ed have talked about virtualization where they could have used the word cloud, because uh, most people mean virtualization when they use the word cloud. So I think the fact that you can scale, especially in a public cloud or a using someone else's computer model, uh, you can scale down your costs when you're, when you're not using the computers by turning them off. That's the fundamentals of the economic driver in cloud. It's, it, it, it's the same in terms of software. It's just somebody else's computer. Uh, and uh, so, so, yes, and so w w but bringing those, th those back to, to, to orchestration, I think um, orchestration's emerged. Um, orchestration has sort of emerged off the back of containerization, actually. There's a big trend in the... Uh, dev community to talk about containers because most of the devs have suddenly got what KV Linux KVMs and containers are all about, and that's super cool and trendy. But um, but actually, you know, whether it brings value or not, it's kind of like whether cloud brings value or not by scaling down costs. And you have to scale down costs. That's kind of cool. But actually, orchestration. You know, you can look at orchestration down on a. Uh, you know, I'm making a GPU talk to a capture card and 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 deciding which. Uh, compression code I'm going to use, or you can look at it like I'm trying to uh, in the next three minutes, or, or, and so architecturally, um, and it really it, it's a way of def I, for me. I think orchestration is largely about capturing our clients' definition of their business problem. Once we've captured that definition of the business problem, we can work out what orchestration they want. And you know, the way we are, we're very DevOps. We, we have a, you know, libraries of clever bits and pieces of software, which we string together to solve problems for our clients. We tend not to string them together as a box and sell those as a product. We tend to react to our clients' needs. And that reactiveness, we embody in reasonably fast orchestration within the internet. So when one of these guys says, we need to do this thing and we need it tomorrow, we kind of draw a flow chart and then we try and turn that into a, a sort of tree architecture and deploy the service by bringing in the various libraries we need to make dance for that particular song, if you like. So well, we do actually say that to him quite often. Yeah. We need this tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or in the next 10 minutes or so. Yeah. But, so I think orchestration, again, it, it needs to, it's, it's not just a strap line you can stick on your marketing PDF um, because until you understand what your client wants, you don't really know what you're orchestrating. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, 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 it's a culmination, it's a point of agreement between the software devs and the, the infrastructure de delivery partner and the client. And it, it's better done when you've delivered, when you've designed or understood the problem better. Uh, better, so Kay. I don't know if that really answered the question. No, I think but it was good, it was I good to be specific. It. Anyone got any follow-up questions um, on those points? Or shall I roll on with my questions? are all very quiet. Eh? I've given okay. a lot of acronyms there. I'm yeah, you have. Yeah, it's there. very specific <laughs> terms as well. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, very good, very good. Okay, um, what are the uh, low-hanging fruit in terms of workflow areas? Everyone talks about elasticity and scalability, yeah. but what are the areas? I mean, everyone here is uh, specifically interested in video production workflows. I've got my own feeling on this, but what do you actually feel from an elasticity and from a scaling point? If people have got bucks to spend or yeah. dollars or euros, where should they be investing? What are the uh, go-to areas? Can I answer this one? Go for it. Um, I'm not going to answer it directly, actually, to be... Yeah, well, uh, uh, politician. you've taken the lead from Dom, I, I'm haven't gonna, you? I'm going well, <laughs> to jump back to what Dom said on, on your opening bit about, and I could, I, could, I could almost sense a sharp intake of breath when you said that you could launch thousands of channels uh, in, a, in a few moments, as opposed to one channel every two months. And people go, oh, how, how can that be? What? That must be madness. But I think the definition of a channel needs to be redefined. And we're looking into the future. In the past, it's we're looking to the future. And what, I what is a channel? What, what do we define as a channel? Do we so for example, uh, DAZN, uh, platform or sport. 
and there aren't any channels on it. Or there are. There are lots of channels that exist purely for a match. And when that match has happened, if you can think of it as a uh, Arsenal v Liverpool channel, and then it's gone. We don't need it again. It's gone. It's, a, it's an event. So channels, for me, don't really matter. Um, it's <coughs> the, the scale of it, and the, the go-to bit to answer the question, is how many channels do I have at any one time? That's my concurrency. What's the maximum number of events that are on at any one time? On a Saturday afternoon, how much capacity do I need? That's the, that's the question. And that's why I need channels spun up, because on a, um, a Thursday afternoon on in sort of end of May, I've got a lot less channels suddenly. Right? Um, then we have other sports which are less predictable because they overrun for a very long time, like tennis can be on for like six hours. Uh, should have finished three hours ago and it's still going. So resources which are tied up, um, we can't say, oh, we're not going to bring you the, the boxing because we've got the tennis on still. Um, so these uh, problems that you have with a, a s fixed number of channels in a, in, in a sports package uh, go away. And the new problem comes around capacity. So to answer the question, my go-to issue is, is where I started off, which is to do with building for scale, making sure that my, my worst case scenario, which is success, <laughs> uh, is something that I can, I can actually manage ruminate on that answer because <laughs> it turns their head upside down. We'll ask Jeff a question. Um, what are the top three issues you tackle when given an initial cloud brief? Um, you're, you're sort of unique in this panel in having uh, experience and uh, taking on the services of the other two guests. <laughs> taking, oh, you see, you see, you were quick with the put down there. Go on, Jeff. Well, so the, the, challenge, the challenge for us is that actually, so we were both a satellite broadcaster and now we're doing OTT and when we're doing you know, streaming. Um, and that's obviously to because the marketplace has changed. So we obviously take, want to take our content to where those customers are. So the customers are now changing. So the whole reason why now TV came about was because it was to go after a new, a new customer base, a new demographic. And, and that's been very successful, as sort of Ben was showing earlier. Um, from the cloud point of view, really, um, I kind of, kind of view it from several points of view. There is, there, as a broadcaster, you own and operate your own data centers. Um, so you already have that sunk, sunk cost of actually doing it. And, and you have, a, and obviously, coming out of the sort of engineering part, part of the business, that um, you have things that have to be engineered to certain standards. You can't have you know, one of something, you can't have single points of failure. You need to obviously pretty much over-engineer it, and obviously that costs a lot of time and money. And that investment needs to be paid off over multiple years. You know, you're capitalizing that, that expenditure. When you go into the cloud, though, it kind of like changes. So you were mentioning about, um, about uh, being able to actually do things quicker. So for example, being able to do um, you know, experiments and stuff that would take you too long on actually on premise to actually being able to do them in cloud is actually much more flexible. You can be much more agile um, to use that. I mean, uh, I myself work in uh, software engineering, which is uh, which is a division. So, um, go so give you a little bit a little bit of background. But uh, this guy, so there was the broadcast department, and then there was software engineering, and then OTT came about, and so the two more recently the two have been combined. And so now what you have is you have um, you lots of developers. I sit in a building with. It's about 900 developers who write the software that customers are using. Now, we, we don't charge for that software. You can go into the App Store and download it for free. Um, you obviously pay for it as a subscription service, and you, you know, buy, the, buy the passes, and you, you enjoy now TV, um, sports, movies, entertainment, etc. Um, or you can have you know, a Sky, SkyGo subscription as part of your value add. So those are things that we do, and we give that software for free. Part of, part of the, the thing about the cloud is, is that I, I could say that a CDN, quite easily argue that CDN is a cloud-based service. So an Akamai, a, a Level 3, mm. you know, Limelight, etc. all mm -hmm. these CDNs out there, they're cloud-based services. They're just servers that are actually distributed around it. Um, so that leads into things around quality of experience. You know, uh, I mean, one of the things that, that, we, that we do is that um, we, own our, we own our own network, or at least like three quarters of, it, of the network. You know, we don't own the last mile. That's really obviously for you know, the people and regulators to actually solve. But we own most of the, the infrastructure and bring those cloud services actually on premise. So we already have. So you know, we, we have Netflix, for example. Netflix servers are on our network because it kind of makes sense from a sort of, you know, we have Google, Google servers in because a lot of our customers, like Sky Broadband customers, they watch YouTube uh, and different content and things. Um, but obviously, also, we have CDNs for so 
this is just to make it cost effective. Customers, you know, good experience. Going back to the cloud, though, um, you know, being being able to do things faster, being able to actually go and try things out. You know, if you want to go and compare um, several things side by side, it's, it's quite it's quite time consuming to actually do it. Um, you know, in your in your offices, in your actual in your lab environment. Now you can do that, but it's it's a big investment time time and effort. If you want to actually just try something out, evaluate something, it's much easier to take a feed and actually put a send a feed to the cloud and actually then consume that consume that feed in the cloud. You know, and to actually try stuff out, so you can actually be more innovative and, and to move move forward, like what similar similar kind of thing to what Dom does. Um, so I think that they, they, there is potentially a sort of hybrid situation where you can get the best of on premise because you can we've already made that investment, and then you can be a little bit more dynamic and, and sort of leverage the cloud where it makes sense. Okay. Now there was a question asked about learning and uh, uh, skills. Quick question from you guys because I want to go more on the live latency thing, but just a quick 30 second answer. How significant is the skill gap and what areas should you concentrate on from training perspectives? What do you believe, Don? There's this, there's, uh, my, Where's my the skills my, gap? My mind immediately jumps to the cultural change. You know, we've yep. got, I come from a world where we don't think about soldering irons and BNC connectors. We think about XML and, and, and config files and, and compiling. And that's the skills gap between the broadcast industry and the next generation. Okay. What do you think, Ed? I, I don't see a skills gap. <coughs> okay. I see an understanding gap. And everything that we've mentioned so far has been way... We've been talking about OPEX and CAPEX and all this stuff that you know, I really hate. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I have no shortage of people with ponytails, men with ponytails, who can understand... ...and everything else that they, they do. And it's fine. There's no problem with that. It's understanding it commercially and understanding the chain of the business has to get it and it's only when they can test it properly okay what do you think Jeff um, I think that um, that if you if you want to try and sort of like close close the skills gap you actually need to bring those skills on so as I said before I'm in software engineering there's all those developers I mean I'm part of what we call the streaming team and the streaming team has several functions one is to actually go and actually build channels and actually put them put them live and then we have an optimization team, which actually go and make sure that uh, that the the streams actually are the best that they can be for our customers. And then there's a third bit, which is actually is DevOps, uh, which is something we've brought in the last 12 months. So we're actually automating the pipeline. Dom kind of mentioned it. So trying to do it at scale for for our channels, because uh, we have to go from I think you mentioned it before, uh, Van, is that you're going from going from world where it takes you literally several months to actually deliver a channel or a series of channels to actually being able to do it in 24 hours. You know, this is the ambition to, to get there, assuming obviously that the video is available. Um, because you know, we, we, operate, uh, we operate in multiple countries, and so faster, it just takes too long now. OK. I was uh, fully behind this live low latency thing. Um, I do quite a lot of positioning, and the worst offender is CDN networks. How do you think they're going to have to adapt? Mm -hmm to live low latency <laughs> applications. Well, well, go for it, Ed, <laughs> because we know that Dom has answer. written big, thick books right. with loads of equations okay. in and things like that. So you get to snack first, okay. then I'll, Jeff, I'll, I'll, and we'll I'm save gonna, the best till last. I'm going to try and guess you. Right? <laughs> Doing low latency for a long, long time. So mm. we've got our super low latency product, which is um, sending events to bookmakers as fast as possible for their own consumption. So when there's been a uh, a goal in outer Mongolia, they can close the book on that straight away. Um, there's another stream, which is also low latency, uh, called the Watch and Bet service, which goes to bookmakers, which they can put on their websites, and then they can uh, keep the book open and but nobody is cheating. That's the, that's the key to those, those two. They work together. Um, now, the Watch and Bet product uh, has been around for quite a long time, and it's currently being reinvented. Um, and it was invented originally around Flash, and we could do low latency to, to the desktop within sort of four seconds was about right for the business, and that was, that was fine. Um, we have a mezzanine encoder, which is our own, our own creation, um, sits on our own private cloud, and that does it, it turns it around um, uh, into a multicast transport stream in about half a second. Um, something else that's going to deliver it to devices, and devices have put a bit of a fly on the ointment because HLS seems to be the most widely accepted or most compatible 
uh, system out there uh, in its current guise. And we're looking at nine, 10 seconds, which is not as good as we'd like it to be. We've got a few tweaks and things. Oh, that's pretty aggressive, by the way. I mean, normally it's much, much longer than that. Um, but we've been able to do a few tweaks to get it even a little bit lower than that. Um, but I think where, where Dom's going to go, and I'll try and guess you here, but um, you also mentioned CDNs as well. So I think peer-to-peer -peer has got to raise its ugly head at some point. And also um, WebRTC, and with the mm. Apple Developers Conference just announcing that Safari is going to support WebRTC. Um, that comes back to latency and the quality slider. We kind of say, well, look, we don't care so much about the quality, perhaps. We're going to uh, get rid of certain things that we're used to having, like a, a right now, adaptive. I can't see how chunk adaptive is going to work in WebRTC. But there's certainly something there which is interesting. WebRTC, by the way, so you can Skype somebody a... a, a um, um, I, was I right? Is that where you're going to yeah, go? Yeah, uh, I'm not so sure about peer to peer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, and stuff, and I think uh, maybe Jeff's got something to add there before I embark on a technical comment. <laughs> yeah, um, so low latency. I, I, okay, if I if I'm a, if I think of myself as being a customer, so I or something like that most recently. Thing from a sort of customer point of view is that is you're watching the match. Um, typically, I watch it on say my iPad or something. And with HLS protocols not being you know, being very CDN friendly, um, because that's that's one of the ways you get scale. But the downside to that is that because it's CDN friendly, it actually is counterintuitive because it actually means that you building building lots of buffer time to actually go and so you can you know have problems uh, which some, sometimes <coughs> happens, and those problems you actually don't know about them because because literally the segment size is so long that you actually you don't see that it was an issue. Um, one of the frustrating things is actually is that Twitter pops up and goes and tells me it's now 1-0 or, you know, the, the sports app comes up and says, right, now it's 1-0. And actually, then 10 seconds later, I actually go and watch it. So there's kind of like sort of 10 to 12 seconds that these kind of the tweets sort of pop up there, which is kind of where, where mm -hmm. you, you were saying from the, uh, from the betting uh, angle. So which it, it kind of like, you know, kills, kills the kind of moment. I mean, there are some sports where it's more relevant. Obviously, like so, uh, football is... Uh, Formula One is is another one as well. Like I was watching the Canadian Grand Prix, and you know, literally, you're watching. I'm um, I'm using it on, on my iPad. I'm watching it live on the on the, t the t TV in my lounge. Then I'm watching the sort of second screen camera angles. So oh, I'm watching so I'm watching I'm watching the pit lane. You know, yeah. I'm watching the things, the scoreboard, the the little markers where they're going around the track. You know, P1, P2, P3, and because I want it to be a sort of more enjoyable experience. But the kind of like what's on my iPad is actually about 20 seconds behind what's actually on the screen. You know, so but. That's how, that's how it is. I mean, there are technologies out there. You can tweak things. You know, you can change things like segment sizes, uh, which is what, what you're trying at the, at the form. You can go down to, you know, like HLS spec, go down to like two, <coughs> two seconds and, you know, reduce the number of fragment sizes. You can do, um, do in the manifest and things like that. The challenge actually then that just becomes that you then get super aggressive on your CDN. So your CDNs now start throwing a lot more traffic uh, to your infrastructure. And so there's this kind of balancing act to be able to do it now. You know, well, this is obviously stay preferably staying within the, the you know the specifications. If you kind of go proprietary, there's people talking about UDP-based solutions. Um, you'll see they're they're hard. You know, when somebody gives you an SDK and they say try that out, um, well, yeah, it might work on this client, but what about all your other clients? You know, because you, you haven't just got one client; you've got like 50 clients to support. Or native players, in my case. Yeah. I think in terms of in terms of where we go from today, you know, at the end of the day, all the technology problems have actually been solved. They're just not available at scale. Mm -hmm. You know, the problem with CDNs is, uh, you know, after the there was a massive fibre glut in 2002, uh, which which then caused a pricing competition with the CDNs. And as they reached the bottom of, of where they could go safely, and they bottomed out at three, two, three cents or or, or, or fractions of that now, uh, they started to compete on KPIs, which frankly nobody cares about. You know, I always joke that people, the CDNs these days will fight over two millisecond difference in their latency. The stream's buffered for 30 seconds. It makes no difference to the viewer. So and I think one of the things the CDNs did is that to con as they tried to consolidate infrastructure internally, they dropped real server, they dropped Windows Media Services, they dropped RTP servers, they dropped all these other technologies, which largely, you know, RTMP. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. sold, sold, I know it solved your for problems years, for yeah. years. You know, yeah. it was awesome. So let's, you know, let, let, it got turned off mm -hmm. because they didn't want to run an HTTP edge and an RTMP edge. Mm -hmm. That's it simple economics on that scale. So the problem was solved, but there wasn't enough demand at some level for the CDNs to be maintaining these multiple session-based 
uh, uh, protocols alongside HTTP and so on. Hence, we've seen this big rush into HTTP, which is great. And then the audience has arrived, I would say, largely over the last sort of six or eight years, the audience arrived. Services scale right up, but now we're starting to see they're reaching the point where maybe the efficiencies that some of the session-based protocols from the early 2000s, late, late 90s even, had already worked out, they're just not available commercially at the edges of the CDN. So we're stuck at the moment with, um, with having to basically fiddle within the HTTP protocols. And TCP's got its own minimum, minimum issues, hence there's people muttering about UDP. UDP's got different error, error transmission control issues because you know, there's, there's a rash of companies trying to rewrite TCP at the moment and sell it as reliable mm -hmm. UDP services and so on and so forth. Um, whether one of those will become a server, I don't know. At the moment, in practical terms, the guys who are asking about low latency, just shorten your IDR link. Yeah. That's it. That's your only option. You can't go into the middle of a GOP. You just can't. So you've got to shorten your IDR link. And that's how Akamai are doing their two-second latency demos at I, uh, NAB and IBC. They're just doing one-second IDRs. That's fine. It's a waste of bandwidth. It's completely counterintuitive to all the other efficiencies we're trying to get. But if your business problem... If is it's low latency, latency. It's that slider. That's your you know, solution if you want to scale. And, and this is the key battleground within compression vendors, you know, for things like IQ and staying within the standardized specs, buffer models, whatever's installed on your player. Mm. I think, you know, that, that's the main area. Now, time is tight. Anyone got a burning question? Go on, gentlemen at the back. Oh, yeah. That's the dreaded success thing, isn't it, really? Can I ask a question back? On what network? On what network? Okay, okay so I, I, I've got a... I, I was joking with the guys earlier. I've had a bet with the uh, Richard Lindsay Davis, head of the DTG, for 10 years now. That if my daughter, she's 10 at the moment, if she ever buys uh, a cable-connected set-top box, I will eat it. What, the daughter? Okay. Or the My daughter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, no, no, she won't. <laughs> Picture the sparrow. But basically, um, we, you know, w w the TV world lives with its head in a bucket because of... I'm pretty contentious about this stuff, so feel free to shoot me down, but I don't work for a PLC. So um, basically, uh, you know, audience measurement has just been guessing. You know, it's total nonsense. And when you see the real numbers of audiences, they're quite disappointing for advertisers. Um, and that culture is coming through fast. I predict a complete transition. I wouldn't say when that three years is, but when it's going to happen over a three-year period because it'll happen as an entire generation has been brought up on mobile devices go to university and they'll stop buying wired services. They'll have 5G. I'm pointing at the man in front of you because um, 5G is working on the LTE Broadcast Alliance and that's multicast on layer two at the edge. Okay, now the wired networks are in such a tangle talking about is a, a bit of a problem yeah um, and, this is and, the answer. and I've spent 10 years with my head in that specific problem and it is a bit of a problem it's actually quite easy to do but it's getting everyone to agree on it's like getting everyone to re-agree on a new DNS architecture it's that simple but it's that difficult at the same time now if 5G coming enables that layer 2 scaling and all the kids leave school go through university without renting wanting a wire in a rented accommodation that they've got to pay for for three months after they moved out, they just clean that entire market out, it'll shelve, everyone will go on to 5G, 5G has the scale for live linear, there's your answer. Jeff, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I can't talk about 5G, uh, but, um, but yeah, I mean, what I would say is that really it's, it's not just a streaming problem, um, obviously there is, you know, I mean, we already use multiple TDNs anyway, um, we have to do that because we're already scaling them, not even anywhere near 10. Uh, but we need to actually look at the whole, the whole what we call the online video platform. So this is you know, authentication, this is sign-in, this is EPG, this is all the other stuff before you even get to pressing the play button. So all of that's got to scale. That's in a challenge in itself. I mean, that's, that's an infrastructure thing. Things like virtualization, particularly microservices, which we haven't actually sort of really touched on uh, much. Those are the kind of technologies that are actually going to try and help you get to that because you can't go and have a thousand VMs that's running you know, a, a, set, a set of application stacks, but you can have a thousand microservices that's doing you know, a bunch of different stuff that actually collectively makes up, makes up you know, your OVP environment. And you can distribute that and you can go horizontal, you can go vertical, however, you, however you, where you want to architect that. But uh, 
the, ultimately the video um, is, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge, you know, trying to do it. And obviously in the future, by the time that 5G arrives, obviously we're going to be in a higher quality world than where we are today. So it's kind of like it's, uh, you know, in one sense, it's the, you know, it's, uh, as you were saying earlier, the thing, it's kind of like it's a, a nice problem to have because at that point, by the time you get to 10 million, you make engineer, you know, people in the room here and people you know, watching on Facebook, they will actually be already offering solutions to how do you do that. But I, what I would also say is that if you take a leaf out of what's happening in the web world, out of the, out of the video space, um, then if you look at, say, okay, well, how do, you, how do you scale like a Sky Sports website, you know, skysports.com, that gets millions, you know, like uh, today the Premier League uh, fixtures was up, were announced. So you know you're going to get several million views today. Now, that infrastructure and that architecture, a lot of it is actually very relevant to how you deliver video. And, and so, so, you know, there's no, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You just need to kind of learn from outside the video space of how you can make video better. I'd add to that, I think all the big, really big live webcasts I've been involved with were never let down by scaling the video delivery. They were let down by the request routing or some paywall or something trivial and small that got forgotten in testing. Or the mic being off. <laughs> the other thing I think, just to, just to add in, the other thing I think that will really, I think that's, I'm watching quite close, closely at the moment is uh, ATSC3 over in the States. I think that's, I think that's going to be quite disruptive. I think public mm. service broadcast is starting to integrate IP into the o OTA stuff is quite, it, it's a little bit like, uh, was it DVB-H mm -hmm. was? Yeah. Ten years ago, but kind of, you know, another generation of that. I think that could be quite interesting. Well, all we've got to do now is wait for the Twittersphere to light up with uh, daughter leaves home from streamed aggression from dad. <laughs> she's been, she's been briefed just to case. stuff her set-top <laughs> box as her next meal. I think they've been a great panel. Thank you very much for uh, uh, all your questions and participation. Dom, Ed, Jeff, thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thirty minutes. Twenty. Twenty. Yeah. Twenty minutes break. Okay, so um, back here just before four o'clock. Yeah. Uh,